There have been few instances in the tech industry when we have seen tech giants swapping places when it comes to market dominance. Intel struck first back in the 90s for the most part with a brand you might have heard of called the Pentium processor. Ever since then, companies have been striking back and forth trying to obtain the performance crown by mainly increasing their core clock speeds. But in 2005, AMD almost struck back and got performance dominance by introducing a feature to the mainstream called multi-core processing. Unfortunately, that success was very short-lived and in 2006, Intel struck back with the Core 2 Duo processor. And ever since then, Intel has just been a powerhouse when it comes to performance and has maintained superiority with both market share as well as mind share when it comes to the desktop processor market. And unfortunately, AMD has just been struggling to maintain relevance in the market. But back in 2015, the engineers over at AMD decided to change their vision when it comes to microarchitectures for their processors. And when they came up with the Zen architecture, it became the catalyst for this company's evolution. Now with Zen 1, they mainly focused on providing many cores to the desktop PC. And with Zen Plus and Zen 2, they've been making iterative improvements towards efficiency as well as overall performance. And in today's video, we finally get to embrace the Zen 3 release of the Ryzen 5000 series processors. What, you guys thought I was gonna show you the real thing? <laughs> in your dreams, I'm keeping this thing in my system. Hey guys, Turk here. I hope you're having a great day. You're gonna have to pardon some of the hype that's coming out of me these past couple weeks, but AMD is firing on, on, on all cylinders and they are just on a war path when it comes to all of their product portfolio. Now I've been covering AMD's processors all the way since 2017 and I've been a huge fan of both their products performance as well as their feature sets. AMD has come a long way from their troubled AM4 launch, but in today's video, we get to embrace the entire three year journey that it's taken to get us here to Zen 3. Now, I don't wanna to dive too deep into the architecture in this video, but I do wanna cover my bases just a bit. Now with Zen 3, AMD's engineers decided to practically re-engineer the core from the ground up, putting a heavy emphasis on reducing latency, increasing the instructions per clock, and of course, increasing efficiency. Now in order to do that, they have re-architected how the CCD is structured and they put all eight cores connected to a contiguous block of level three cache. Of course, they're still using the seven nanometer process from TSMC, but it is much more matured now and they've learned a lot of things in the manufacturing. And of course, for performance, they're putting a heavy emphasis when it comes to single threaded performance. As I've mentioned earlier, we actually have seen a lot of these improvements coming in from generation to generation, but with Zen 3, we get to see it in its final fulfilled form. As it stands today, Zen 3 is going to be rolling out four different variants of their processors. That's the 6-core 5600X, the 8-core 5800X, 12-core 5900X, and the king of the castle is going to be their 16-core offering through the 5950X. Each of these processors is gonna have double the amount of threads available to them, which would be 12, 16, 24, and 32 threads, respectively. For power, each of these processors is going to be inheriting their older predecessors' TDPs, and unfortunately though, AMD decided to drop the coolers off of their three top processors, mainly because through their research, they found that many builders are using custom cooling, either through bigger air coolers or through water cooling of some sort. My original intent for this video is going to be looking at the eight core offerings from AMD all throughout the generations, including the Ryzen 7 1700X, 2700X, 3700X, and hopefully the 5800X. And of course, eight cores is a great configuration when it comes to gaming, so I decided to put it up against my Intel Core i7 10700K. Now, I've been very blessed and I've been able to get my hands on a Ryzen 9 5900X, which is arguably the best processor of this current generation. But unfortunately, that kind of throws a wrench into my whole scheme. But you guys know me, I'm not gonna let that stop me from doing what I wanna do. So I went into the Precision Boost Overdrive menu and I disabled uh, two core from each of the CCDs on our 5900X. And I also capped it thermally to about 63 degrees Celsius in order to maintain a boost clock speed of right at 4.7 gigahertz in order to match the 5800X. Now this isn't an accurate representation of the 5800X. So in all of my charts today, I will be putting it in quotes and only using it as reference. My Intel test bench today is gonna to be using the ASUS Z490E gaming ROG Strix motherboard that we've reviewed previously on the channel. 
That test bench utilizes the Fractal Design S36 AIO cooler. To give Intel the best showing in today's results, I'm going to be removing the Intel defined power limits. As for the AMD test system, we're going to be using the MSI MPG X570 Gaming Edge Wi-Fi motherboard using the latest BIOS as available on the website. The Corsair H110i 280mm AIO is in charge of cooling the system. From there, each system equips four sticks of 8GB of Corsair Dominator Platinum clocked down to 3200 on the data rate. Unfortunately, Zen 1 and Zen Plus based processors are known for less than stellar data rates in this configuration, so they are down clocked to 2933 and 3066 respectively. For GPU today, I'm still going to be using my tried and true EVGA RTX 2080 Super Hybrid because unfortunately I just can't get my hands on the RTX 3000 series processors and AMD's RX 6800 XT, I'm just patiently waiting for that to come onto store shelves. For this graphics card, I am going to be down clocking its boost clock speed to right at 1930 MHz in order to more match the reference design for the RTX 2080 Super. Now let's start getting into the benchmarks. I like to start off with synthetics in order to confirm my sanity and also to see if there's any trends that I should keep my eye on as we go through the different charts. PC Mark Essential shows excellent scaling across the generations of Zen and the 5000 series bests, the 10th generation from Intel in the Essentials and Productivity benchmarks. Digital content creation does lag behind a bit when it comes to rendering and visualization, but overall both the 5800X and 5900X do well. Geekbench 4 shows similar behavior, but with the 5000 series surpassing the competition. Now for some real world workloads. Looking over the years in the 8 core processors in Cinebench R20, we've been given between 16 and 20 percentage point increases in single core performance with each iteration of the Zen architecture. With Zen 2, AMD was within striking distance of the Intel's i7-10700K. But finally, both of our Zen 3 based processors pull ahead and handsomely beat Intel. Multi-core performance has always been a strong suit with Ryzen, though with Zen 3, we do only observe a 15% increase over Zen 2. God, the nerve. As a content creator, creating videos and doing all sorts of renders is a very time-intensive task. Unfortunately, minimal reductions inside of DaVinci Resolve have been seen across the board, though we do see considerable time reductions with the transition from 2700X to the 3700X. Adding salt to the wound, the Intel 10700K still manages to keep the lead even though it is within seconds of the older processors. On a more positive note, our standard time workloads clearly enjoy both the frequency and core advantage of the latest Ryzen processors, with a definite 15% generation on generation improvement in X264 encoding times, while H.265 encoding times mimic the trends we see with Cinebench. Obviously, the 12-core AMD chip runs circles around the 10700K, and unfortunately for Intel, this only shows slight signs of optimism with the rumored improvements that are coming our way with Rocket Lake. Moving to more specialized workloads, Luxmark continues the trend with generation on generation improvements for AMD's chips, finally beating Intel's latest offerings. POV Ray is the first workload we encounter where single threaded performance struggles with the AMD architecture and our multi-core performance still struggles to keep up with the Intel's eight core processor. Fortunately, throwing additional cores at the problem seems to work in this instance, but that is a pretty unfair advantage. But V-Ray puts us back on track with CPU scaling as we expect. Lastly, in an exciting twist, why Cruncher observes the most considerable improvement going from the Zen 2 with the 3700X with the 5800X only seeing mild enhancements to win over Intel. Still, the 12 core processor doesn't fare much better. Now gaming is a huge emphasis with the Ryzen 5000 series processors, but unfortunately d these days, many games are really starting to utilize much more of the GPU's horsepower, and it's really up to the CPU to just get out of the way and let the GPU do its thing. So in order to emphasize that, we're gonna be testing at 1080p, 1440p, and only at the high detail level settings across the different generations of Ryzen. Let's jump in. 
Taking a look at Fire Strike Extreme, this is going to be running at 1440p resolution. We do observe that the physics score does seem to increase as we're going along the generations of Ryzen processors, but unfortunately that increase does not manifest itself in an improved 3D Mark score or a graphics score. And to add salt to the wound, the combined scores don't even reflect this physics score improvement. So fortunately though, for the Ryzen 5000 series processors, they are able to squeak past the 10700K when it comes to the physics score, and that's something to be proud of. Now, if we take a look at 3D Mark Time Spy, we do see a similar trend where the physics score is increasing as we go across the generations, but again, the graphics score as well as the 3D Mark scores, we're just not seeing as drastic of an increase that we would like to see. Shadow of the Tomb Raider was one of the highlights in the Zen 3 announcement, and sure enough, we can confirm their results with a 23% performance improvement. However, the 3700X still managed to beat the 10700K, so frame rates will only improve with higher-end GPUs installed. 1440p does temper our expectations, though, with only seeing a 7 FPS spread between Zen Plus and Zen 3. Ashes of the Singularity really doesn't even care if you're running at a different resolution, but it does love it some Zen 3. Even at 1440p, we see FPS improvements improving from 9 percentage points up to 14 with our artificial 5800X, which handedly beats the Intel competitor. However, shifting to the crazy preset, GPU limitations keep us stuck right at around 76 FPS. GTA 5 sees similar scaling, though not as dramatic, with around 10 percentage points increasing between the 3700X and the 5800X. But doesn't it just feel good to be beating Intel by a whopping 2 FPS at 1080p? <coughs> don't, don't look at 1440p. Red Dead Redemption 2 is a heavily GPU-bound game, and despite the generational improvements from either company, this 2080 Super is stuck at right around 98 FPS at 1080p and 89 at 1440p. Favoring quality doesn't help us out either. Now, let's quickly pivot back to a CPU-based game with uh, Warhammer and just you know, get our endorphins running again, and woohoo, we actually see an, a, a performance improvement at 1080p. Um, don't look at 1440p. Unfortunately, I don't have time to retest the Intel part with F1 2020, but as far as ultra settings are concerned, AMD's processors are floating around 150 FPS with the eight core parts, and 1440p is hovering right around 120 FPS. Judging by my 10700K view, you guys really enjoyed to see my streaming results for a single streaming PC setup, so we're gonna do a similar test with the Ryzen 5000 series processors and see just how well things have improved going from the 3700X. For this test, we're gonna be testing all the games in 1080p windowed mode using a high detail preset, and then we're gonna be capturing all of the footage with OBS running at various different bitrate levels, as well as two different H.264 encoding settings, medium and slow. If you guys want me to try any additional bitrate settings or quality presets, let me know down in the comments below. One point of contention in our previous review was that the 3700X overloaded when running Red Dead Redemption 2 at the slow preset at 1080p scaled resolution. Unfortunately, the 8-core 5800 manages to pull ahead faster FPS, but still struggles to maintain a consistent stream output. However, the additional cores on the 5900X keeps us streaming at an even pace to the 10700K. We see a similar story with GTA 5, where we do get a substantial FPS increase at the various streaming settings, but at 1080p slow encode, we still choke out all of our 8-core processors. With Shadow of the Tomb Raider, I don't happen to have the overall average FPS for the 3700X or the 10700K, but I can say that if you plan on single PC streaming this game, either stick to a 720p output resolution or consider picking up the 5900X. Lastly, Ashes of the Benchmark continues to manhandle our 8-core processors today, but I am pleased to announce that the 5900X can stream the game at each of the tested bit rates and presets. I'm pretty sure the additional cores help give OBS the actual fighting chance to actually encode the output. 
Interestingly, we do see a steady decrease in gameplay frame rate as we increase the CPU load through encoding. So far, AMD's 5000 series processors have been performing pretty well, but let's take a look at the claims of increased efficiency. Now, in order to keep things fair here, I'm only going to be testing the 10700K versus the 5900X since those are the actual products I have on hand today. Well, it turns out from a power perspective, the Zen 3 based platform consumes more energy at idle, full system load, and at a moderate CPU utilization through the IDA64 CPU stress test. Though this might appear off-putting, the CPU is doing exactly what it was designed to do, boost as high as it can within the thermal and power limits. And sure enough, the 5900X is boosting to an amazing 4500 MHz while running IDA64, however, raw, quote, efficiency still goes to Intel while utilizing their defined power limits. Now, does this trend transfer to temperatures? Well, the short answer is yes. AMD does an excellent job of boosting its clock speeds while maintaining a sub 70 degrees Celsius temperature. Removing Intel's power limits here goes to show that sometimes unlocking power doesn't translate into better performance. Now, overall, I've actually been observing that there might still be some headroom left on these motherboards and processors because as I was running some of these tests, I noticed through hardware info that our uh, EDC value, the CPU EDC value, was stuck at right around 130 amps. So I'm really looking forward to testing these processors with Precision Boost Overdrive. Again, that video is gonna have to come for another day. Now that we've got a good handle on the performance and the power and the thermals, let's actually look at a feature set that's not really talked about in these reviews, and that is the AMD ecosystem. With first gen Ryzen, AMD was simply trying to get their foot in the door with their new architecture. As Zen 2 started coming out the door, enhanced features such as XFR evolved into Precision Boost, and newer motherboard chipsets have embraced features like Precision Boost Overdrive and Store MI. AMD has also been forward thinking with their platforms embracing Generation 4 PCI and next generations migrating to DDR5 with the AM5 socket. As we stand today, AMD has technologies that unlock additional performance when using their Radeon branded GPUs, and mobile solutions can even implement smart shift technology to provide extra headroom to critical components. Given their current partnerships with Sony and Microsoft and prominent usage in several modern supercomputers, AMD has an excellent footing to innovate and deliver Zen 4 with even more enhanced features. So what are my final thoughts on Ryzen 5000? To be honest, I am really glad that AMD was able to deliver on all of their engineering promises, especially when it comes to single-threaded performance in almost all of the games and applications we've tested today. But what's even more impressive is that on generation on generation, even all the way from Zen 1, we have gotten uh, double-digit improvement gains in almost all of the different applications we've tested tested today. And now that is actually the kind of performance dominance we like to see from a company, and it is forcing Intel to actually get back on its heels and figure out what its next move is going to be. So we're going to be patiently waiting to see what the Rocket Lake architecture with Intel is going to look like in 2021. Now, here's the bad news, and would I actually recommend Ryzen 5000? Well, I would say if you're rocking a Zen 1 or a Zen Plus base processor like a 1700X or 2700X, it might be a worthwhile upgrade as long as your motherboard supports it to go to the newer processors because you're leaving you know 20 to 40 percent uh, performance improvement in most applications on the table however if you're rocking a ryzen 3000 based processor i don't see the justification and the increase in cost going with the ryzen 5000 series to make it worth a worthwhile choice especially since ryzen 3000 is practically all the way up there and especially if you're going to be gaming at 1440p or 4k the additional frequency and single-threaded performance is not really realized with the higher resolutions. Tack that on with the increased $50 MSRP for most of the products we've talked about today, as well as the lack of a heatsink and cooler. Unless you've already got a custom AIO, that's going to be a problem trying to cool these powerhouses of a processor. All right, well, unfortunately, the video is starting to get a little bit lengthy, so I'm gonna have to cover overclocking, precision boost overdrive, infinity fabric, memory scaling, all of these other topics. We're gonna have to cover it in a different video, so make sure you guys hit the bell down below so that way you're notified when we drop more videos to the channel. And actually, I've got a new project in the next couple weeks. I've got a new project coming in the next couple weeks, and that's uh, upgrading my NAS box with some products from IcyDoc. Uh, there are a couple new custom enclosures, and I think you guys will enjoy that video. 
So make sure if you guys like this video, make sure you hit the thumbs up, share it with your friends, as well as subscribe to the channel. We got lots of cool content coming to you guys. I hope you guys have a great day. Take care.